Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Good morning. Very nice to see you. As you know, we are discussing democratization, and this falls under political development, which is our focus now. And my first question for you was, why is democratization a development issue? You know, what does democratization have to do with political economy and economics? What does it have to do with social and political and, and economic freedom that we think about at an individual level? What does it have to do with those individual freedoms and capacities that Sin talked so much about? And so far in the course, we've mainly focused on the economics and the social aspects of development. But now we begin to see that politics does matter a lot and democratization is a development issue because democratization has to do with creating a system where people can exercise civil and political rights and liberties freely and where they can participate more actively in the economy or in society or in politics. And so development is political. It does have to do with democratization and individual rights and liberties and freedoms. And in my own research, I focus a lot on the political economy of democratization issues. So for me, it's always been natural to talk about democratization and development as one and talk about them as, as synonymous, as consistent with each other. And the discussion about development and democratization has to always include consideration of the case of Chile. Now, you know that the country of Chile is noteworthy in political economy circles because it was the earliest example of neoliberal development. Chile pursued a neoliberal development strategy that involved privatization, liberalization, reducing government involvement in the state and in the economy. In general, Chile was the first success story and the earliest proponent of, of neoliberal reform. And rapid growth and sustained growth in the 80s and the 90s did typify the experience in that country. But unfortunately, the Chilean experience wasn't as, how shall we say, perfect and complete as we would like. If we think about development as involving civil rights and liberties and political rights and liberties and the development of, of freedoms and capacities on a political as well as an economic and a social level, the Chile case falls far short because those neoliberal reforms took place under repressive military rule and a period of military rule that lasted about 18 years. This is not at all consistent with the vision of development as freedom that Sen talked a lot about. And at the time, countries also turned their back on Chile increasingly. And in fact, the US government had a, uh, an embargo, an, an arms embargo on Chile and other limits on the relationship with Chile in the 80s because of the, the repressive military regime. And so it wasn't until the transition to democracy that the relationship between the United States and Chile normalized. And so the reason that Chile is so important is because it highlights that economic and social improvements don't always coincide with political improvements. Democratization does not always come along with political and economic reform. And in the case of Chile, we, we see this most evidently. And so what we're gonna be doing today is we're gonna be talking about the relationship between democratization and development and the role that democratization plays in development. And then we'll begin to talk about some different perspectives on democratization and in particular, some different economic perspectives. Now, before we get there, I'm going to introduce democracy and democratization by kind of giving you a historical overview where I talk about the emergence of democracy and how particular social and economic changes in early modern Europe prefigured the, 
creation of, of representative democratic institutions. And so this is our starting point, starting in Chile. You know that in Chile, neoliberal reforms were embraced and advanced for a, the period of about 20 years, beginning in 1974. It wasn't until 1989 that the country transitioned to democracy and elections took place. But during that period of 17 or 18 years, a very, very repressive military dictatorship ruled the country. And although it began as a collegial military junta, this man, Augusto Pinochet, very quickly sort of rose to the surface and consolidated personal power within the regime. And for the, the space of about 16 years, really ruled the country uh, as a personalist dictator within what was otherwise a, a collegial military junta. During the reign of Pinochet and the military dictatorship, the military suppressed Congress, they burned down the presidential palace, they closed and shuttered parties, they persecuted dissidents, they basically eviscerated civil and political society in every conceivable way. They left no space for dissent or opposition, and they even went further and very zealously rounded up those who they suspected of opposition, and, but who had not necessarily even expressed uh, opposition or, or, or discontent. The point was they were active in, acting impulsively and, and often proactively to eliminate what they perceived to be a threat. And in some, they killed or disappeared about 3,000, very large number for what is a very small country. And they killed, well, they, they tortured tens of thousands, I should say, and they exiled 200,000 Chileans, including many, many prominent leaders of political parties in political and civil society groups who had been at the forefront of, of movements to deepen democracy in, in the period leading up to, to the military junta and the military coup. The question that arises for us and that we've already begun to address is, you know, is this consistent with Sen's idea of development as freedom? Chile is the best example of a neoliberal reformer, a country that pursued a neoliberal development strategy. But it would be very difficult to say that this political regime that coincided with that neoliberal strategy is consistent with the idea of development as freedom. There doesn't appear to be any freedom in this situation. By definition, it appears to be uh, borderline fascism. And in the question for you to think about as we proceed is, what are the implications? And does this suggest that neoliberal development strategies are difficult to pursue absent repressive military rule? Does it suggest that in Chile at this time, development was incomplete, at least to the extent that democratic reform had not yet taken place? What does this suggest about the compatibility of different components or elements in a development strategy. At the time in the literature, one of the key conclusions and arguments was that these neoliberal reforms could only be carried out effectively and successfully if power was concentrated in the hands of an executive. And they were largely concluding this based on the experience in Chile where Pinochet used his personal power and used his concentration of power to, to advance and, and to support and, and to implement and impose these, these neoliberal reforms. It, it would not have been possible to impose those reforms without this extreme concentration of power in this very repressive and illiberal form of military rule. And the evidence that you might need to see to, to believe that is that in subsequent decades, really nowhere did neoliberal reform get off the ground um, under democracy with the partial exception of Argentina. But even in Argentina, it really was emergency powers and the concentration of power in the hands of President Minim that made it possible to push through and advance in particular privatization legislation that would have probably otherwise been, been held up. And so the argument that neoliberal reforms are often only successful if they are accompanied by 
authoritarian rule is, is still an argument that often holds up just because of how difficult politically those neoliberal reforms are, are because of the cost that they impose on labor and often the beneficiaries of the early model. Yes, Lewis, uh, by definition, a dictatorship is a, a political regime where constitution and law are a poor guide of behavior and where ordinarily, um, you know, the political government, the government will use um, extra constitutional means or repression to maintain its rule. But that certainly doesn't negate the brutality and the, and the viciousness of the Chilean dictatorship. Um, I'm not sure what your, your comment is suggesting. Do you want to make a comment, Lewis? There are military dictatorships that are less brutal. In Ecuador, for example, the military dictatorships didn't kill people. They generally were benevolent in that they presided over investments in productive capacity, in public works projects. They were very much involved in a kind of entrepreneurial development strategy that involved the state and the use of state resources, but that did not involve repression or coercive behavior. And so it's not really a definitional trait of authoritarian regimes that they be vicious and, and repressive. There are many examples of, of non-democratic regimes that you know, did not resort to brutal repression and, and, and vicious disappearances and, and killings in order to govern. Uh, you know, there are examples elsewhere in Latin America where the military also didn't didn't engage in that kind of that kind of extra constitutional, extra legal activity. But um, it certainly is true that in the Southern Cone in countries like Chile and Argentina and Brazil, Uruguay, to a certain extent, the military regimes were quite repressive. But what I'd like to pose to you as we move on is the, the possibility or the question that maybe development is inconsistent with neoliberalism in a political sense because ordinarily neoliberal reform uh, is difficult to achieve democratically and it often does require this concentration of power. Yeah, Rady, they also um, murdered the, the democratically elected president, Allende. Brady says, I can't believe they destroyed the presidential palace. I wonder if that action had some kind of symbolism over the behavior that the regime was showing. Well, so the context is, is that in Chile at the time, President Allende had been democratically elected two years earlier and he was a socialist uh, representing the socialist party. And he had begun democratically with a mandate in the approval of the Congress he had begun a process of nationalization and was nationalizing key industries. And in Chile, much of the economy at that time was held by a very narrow group of families and elite families who stood to be very badly affected by nationalization because it would impose steep losses on them and they would lose their means of, of, of control of the means of production. So what happened was as President Allende went deeper and deeper into this nationalization campaign, he began to provoke more and more controversy, controversy and at a certain point began to lose some of the support of certain legislators in the Congress. And there was a disagreement about whether he was taking up legislation and signing legislation quickly enough that would have prevented some of his nationalizations. And eventually this disagreement spilled into what was an institutional crisis. And effectively what happened was the crisis spun out of control and the military eventually got involved. There was also the role of the US CIA sort of endorsing, if you will, and supporting a coup as a means of sort of beating back and preventing this transition to socialism that Allende was, was spearheading. 
they burned down the palace and they killed Allende. And it was symbolic. It was also a sign of force, a show of force, if you will. And the military was very, very vicious and prepared to, to do whatever possible to prevent what they called the, the threat of communism and the threat of socialism. And so what began is a democratically elected president imposing and pursuing policies that he had a mandate for ended with the presidential palace being burned down and that president being killed. And there is some disagreement, some say that Allende killed himself, but if you go to Chile, there's very little evidence that he did that. It seems to, seems to be the case that they killed him. And I think that that's probably the most likely scenario as well. I did visit this, the museum, uh, the, Memor the Memorial for Human Rights in Santiago, and they have a very, very dignified uh, memento to this. And they present the situation very much the way I just did, although they don't weigh in on the question of the precise cause of Allende's death. It appears to be a consensus, or at least the the, the widest understanding that, that he did not kill himself. And so that's where we'll leave it. But this is the situation in Chile. And what I wanted to show you is that democratization is a part of development. It's a part of social progress. It's a part of improvement along social and economic dimensions because the ability to exercise civil rights and political liberties, the ability of you and I to engage in this exercise of civil rights and political liberties, that is part of development. That is part of freedom. That is part of the capacity to choose, to act freely, to be free from sudden or arbitrary or vicious death. And in general, it has to do with our freedom as an individual. And democratization then is part of this progress. Let me read you a quote that captures this idea and that will help to put this in context for us. This is a quote from the 90s from um, an article that's talking about the circumstances and that moment in history, that moment in time. Whatever we call it and whatever its limits, the movement out from under military dictatorships in several Latin American nations has been almost universally welcomed. The democratic transitions are a good thing. The establishment of civilian regimes and formal democratic procedures most recently in Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay, is a positive development insofar as it creates a potential for more far-reaching social and economic progress. In case anyone is disillusioned with what this process of change has accomplished, a quick glance at Chile under Pinochet should provide a powerful antidote. And this article at the time was reflecting on how decisive the change was in countries like Chile and Uruguay and Brazil, where the transition from military rule to democracy was a transition from very harsh, very repressive authoritarian rule to at least formally procedurally more open participatory democracies where ordinary and common citizens could participate in, in politics and could do so freely and could exercise their, their rights and their liberties, could exercise their freedoms. And what that opened up was the possibility that they could achieve more far-reaching social and economic progress. And so even in a country like Chile, where the neoliberal reforms, the neoliberal development strategy was pursued under authoritarian rule, it wasn't until the transition to democracy that we could say that the system was, was more fully supportive of, of a transition to, to full development. It wasn't until the country transitioned to democracy that it became possible to reach those greater heights. And that's because under the military and during that 18 years of military rule, parties were banned, the Congress was shuttered, the presidential palace had been burned to the ground, all democratic institutions had been essentially destroyed. And under that circumstance, people cannot exercise their rights and liberties, they cannot exercise their freedoms. And thus it becomes important for us to envision development as being political as well as economic and social. Without the political component, we would be stuck under military rule in Chile and we wouldn't be able to fully harvest the, the, the gains or experience the full gains from, from development. Let me read you another 
quote from Alejandro Foxley in this case, who was a former Chilean minister of finance. Now, Foxley said the following, economists must not only know their economic models, but also understand politics, interests, conflicts, passions, the essence of collective life. For a brief period of time, you could make changes by decree, but to let them persist, you have to build coalitions and bring people around. You have to be a politician. And so Foxley is making a direct reference to the transition to democracy. He's making reference to how under authoritarian rule, neoliberal reforms, neoliberal economic po policies were implemented and imposed without consideration or input from the population or the stakeholders or the parties or the coalitions. But under democracy, those same economic policies must be reconciled with the interests and the passions of voters and political parties and democratic institutions. In order to impose those policies under a democracy, you've got to become a politician. And so part of development is, is, is political. Part of development is inescapably political, regardless of, of the circumstances under which those original models are introduced, for them to survive and for them to take root and to take flight, so to speak, democratic politics must become part of the equation. And there must be the political component, the rights and the liberties, the freedom to choose, the freedom to participate. And what this also means, moreover, is that democratic choice must also leave open the possibility that the policies themselves are reversed. This is the difficult thing about democratic politics. De democracy as a process doesn't make any guarantee about the outcome. Introducing democracy in the restoration of democracy in Chile did not guarantee or ensure the survival of the neoliberal model. In fact, it meant that that neoliberal model would now be subject to continual reappraisal referendums, so to speak. Voters get to decide. Parties and, co and coalitions and institutions get to decide. The political is a component of development. And this is where we are at this stage, dealing with the politics of development and the, the political part of the development process. And what we're going to do to explore this is we're going to first address the social origins of democracy. And we're going to talk about the economic and social roots and foundations of democracy, where democracy sort of came from, how it evolved and how it emerged, in, in particular, what social and economic context gave rise to democracy. In turn, we're going to explore two economic perspectives on democratization. These are economic models or models of democratization that focus on the economic factors or the economic components that can account for transitions to democracy. And then finally, on Friday, later on, we will begin some simulations and exercises, some different scenarios that I plan to insert you in and show you as, a, as part of our study of the economic aspects of democratization. Now, before we get started, it's important for you to know that democratization is a gigantic literature. There's a massive, massive, massive literature that spans multiple disciplines. There are extensive works in political science, economics, history, sociology, and we have a variety of different perspectives on democratization. There are historical and, and cultural and social perspectives. There are international perspectives. The economic perspectives constitute just one set or one family of explanations. But what I'll tell you is that they occupy a powerful position in the literature because the economic explanations are very useful, especially when we talk about economic development and the consequences of development for regimes. Consequently, the economic perspectives loom the largest often in the discussion. So we'll focus on these perspectives and then the exercises that we'll do will involve me kind of inserting you in situations where you're given information and you're 
invited to make a choice about how to respond to different circumstances or scenarios based on our, our knowledge or our understanding of these different concepts and these models. So this is a, a fun discussion. And I think that there's something here for all of us. Those of you who've taken transitions to democracy, some of this will be recognizable to you. Those of you who have not, uh, this may be new. Those of you from economics, this might be new material as well. But I think that even those of you who've seen some of this, you'll find that discussing it in our, our context will, will shed new light on, on these discussions. So let's get started. So the first question for us, and maybe the most historical of questions is, how did modern democracy get started? How did democratic transitions become a thing? Presumably, democracy hasn't always been the norm. And we do distinguish between classical and, and modern democracy. There's a big, big difference between ancient Greece, ancient Rome, and early modern England or contemporary Germany or the, the United States. So we're going to go back to the starting point and we're going to try to understand the emergence of democratic institutions as a economic and social process, the result of socioeconomic changes that then impacted the balance of power within particular societies at particular moments in time, thus setting off this path of, of democratic development the world over. And so we're going to go to early modern England. That's our starting point. This is a period of time where peasants, people in the countryside, are moving to urban areas in large numbers. They're also seeing the gentry or the new nobles or the new moneyed class begin doing business in the towns as well. And so people like the English gentleman here, the man of distinction, are increasingly doing business in towns and engaging in commerce, exchanges and transactions. Peasants are starting to move to towns as well. And they're working in new productive facilities or places or shops where they're working in in groups or in larger numbers than they previously were in the country. All of this is really, really important because these economic and social changes actually trigger the beginning of a process that leads up to the creation of institutions of representative government. And if you're asking how and why, that's the right question. But any economic and socioeconomic perspective always begins in this way by pointing to those initial changes in the social and economic environment that set off some path of development or set off some certain trajectory that leads to some outcome. And in early modern England, peasants moving to the cities, the gentry doing business in the towns, these become really, 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 really important changes because they are structural changes. These are basically like sectoral changes. Remember how we talked about how societies can be viewed as developing through sectoral or structural changes? In a similar way, these, socio these social and economic changes produce structural shifts or alterations in the economy and in the larger sort of balance of economic power. And, and basically what happened was there was a shift away from the old agricultural elites who were mainly farmers and toward wool makers, merchants, bankers, financial intermediaries, people in the towns who were doing commerce. Now these old agricultural elites who are more and more on the out they controlled observable assets because they're farmers, right? How many fields they have, that could be res readily observed by the crown or by the state, the king. And so it becomes very, very easy to take or expropriate those assets or at a very minimum record their size and volume so that you can effectively tax 
the farmers, those old agricultural elites. These changes are affecting those old agricultural elites negatively by weakening them. Now, at the same time, these new elites, these bankers, these merchants, these wool makers, they are getting stronger and stronger and stronger because they're getting larger in number and they're increasingly clustering in the cities. And what's distinctive about them and makes them different from the old elites is that they control assets that cannot be observed. If you're making wool, if you're a banker who's charging interest, if you're a merchant who's selling spices and rum, these are things that you can hide easily. And so the the scope and the volume and the value of your assets might be quite extensive, but you can hide it from the crown, from the state, who can't easily find out how much you actually have and in turn can't effectively tax you or take your assets or expropriate them. And so what that meant is that the new elites, the merchants, the wool makers, the bankers, they could now hide their assets and they could easily stop the state from taxing them. These structural changes work against the state. It makes it difficult for the crown and for the king to appropriate or expropriate or tax those new assets. These new actors then are occupying an increasingly powerful position because these structural changes are undermining those traditional forms of power that existed prior to the early modern period. Now this is fascinating because this is the historical emergence of the social foundations, the economic foundations of what you'll see is representative democracy. So this change in the balance of economic power was quite consequential because it altered the balance of political power between the crown and the parliament. Now, let's take this piece by piece and see how this happened. The parliament is representing the economic elite, and in particular, the new economic elite, these bankers, these merchants, these wool makers, the people who are moving to the towns. The parliament is representing these new economic elite, but the parliament does not currently have power over the crown. The crown needs money. The parliament is representing the people who have the money. The crown needs money because it's fighting wars that are increasingly expensive and that it's finding itself in a harder and harder position to pay for. And so the crown now has to begin to negotiate with the new elites to get the money that it needs to finance its wars. These new elites represented by the parliament, they demand limits to state predation in return for paying their taxes. They say, if you want us to pay taxes and finance your wars, well, you need to promise us that you won't overtax our assets, that you won't expropriate our assets, in that you won't predate or take them or steal from us, that you will keep your distance and that you will only tax us appropriately. This was the deal and they got it. The crown needed the money so bad that the crown gave parliament certain powers that would ensure the protection of the new elites. Specifically, the crown allowed the parliament the power to authorize the crown's expenditure. This was basically fiscal supremacy of parliament over the crown. And so the settlement was parliament had the power to authorize the expenditure of the crown. The crown would not expropriate or take the assets of the new elite. And thus, we have a new balance of power and we have new institutions and we have 
the equality, the equal relationship between the parliament and the crown. The specific settlement was parliament now had the power to authorize the crown's expenditure. Now, this is really, really interesting because this shows you that democracy itself as a set of institutions, it really was the product of structural changes in the economy that themselves contributed to economic development. The transition from agriculture to industry, the transition from living in the countryside to living in the towns, the transition from agricultural production to wool production, to commerce, to banking, textiles, goods. These structural changes we already associate with development. And so it makes sense that these same structural changes would also be at the heart of the emergence of democratic institutions, in particular, the parliament as a, a check and balance institution with the executive. But what's interesting is that there's a backstory here. And in order for us to fully understand the story of the emergence of democracy, we've got to go to the back history. And we've got to consider the choices that the new elite made leading up to this conflict with the crown. So notice, if the elites are saying, you must protect our investment, it implies that the crown previously expropriated or took or overtaxed or stole some of the assets of that segment of the new elite. So it suggests that be before democracy existed under authoritarianism, the king did take and expropriate the assets of individuals. Now, isn't that interesting? Because that means that democracy did evolve as part of development. If we think about development as individual rights and liberties, property rights, freedom to own and control property and to be free from the state's expropriation. But it's important for us to think about the choices that the elite faced at this moment when the crown had confiscated some of their assets and they were now in conflict with the crown. They could have done one of three things. They could have disinvested from the economy, maybe gone elsewhere, theoretically, presumably, right? They could voice their objections and in doing so petition the crown protection for continued investment. You protect our assets, don't overtax us, don't take our assets, we will continue to invest. Or they could have exhibited loyalty and they could have continued investing in paying taxes. Now, based on these choices, it's evident that they chose number two they chose to petition the crown and demand the protection of their, their assets in exchange for the continuation of their investment. They chose the second course of action. They chose not to exit and they chose not to remain loyal. Democracy then emerged as a result of these social and economic changes and the ways that the economic structural changes altered the balance of power in society. And what you'll notice is that this is essentially how we understand democratization from an economic perspective. We basically understand democratization as a result of these class conflicts or these tensions that arise between an elite, a new elite, and an old traditional king or crown. The interests of that new elite are in tension with the interests in the political power of that old traditional 
crown. And the conflict between them results in a settlement that produces democracy. It produces democracy because that old traditional crown, that king, depends on the investments of the new economic elite for the tax revenue that finances the wars and the imperialism of that old traditional king. And so what you wind up with is you, would, you wind up with an equilibrium, a situation in the middle where the king and the new elite meet halfway. And where they meet halfway is where they construct democratic institutions. The parliament, the legislature, is the original democratic institution because it represents the interests of the new economic elite in their relationship with this old traditional royalty. In all societies, the transition to democracy can essentially be interpreted in a similar way. Now, to be sure, the model doesn't fit perfectly everywhere, and there are a lot of different models. But what you'll notice over and over, if you look closely, is that economic class and the tensions between classes in structural changes in the economy often do propel democratic transitions. They often do generate those changes in regime. And this is why democratization is fundamentally a political economic problem. It is something that is intimately connected with development. It is a product of development and it is also a cause of development. But there's more to this. And what's interesting is when we begin to peel back some of the layers and consider some of the different ways that economic variables have been studied in democratization literature. And the first of two that we'll look at is what we associate with what's called the social forces tradition. This is basically a theory of democratization that says that the cause of democratic transitions can be located in the relationships between social classes and really in the relative strength of the different social classes. The idea is that the social classes are always and everywhere locked into these relationships, these relationships of unequal power and unequal influence. And that the top dog in that relationship at any given time is going to determine the outcome of the struggle and whether the society transitions to democracy or remains a dictatorship. And so this tradition assumes that the dominant class, the landlords and the capitalists, basically prefer dictatorship because under that scenario they don't have to share and they can rule society and control the decision making on the other hand the workers the middle class peasants they want democracy because democracy allows them to exert more control over those upper classes and to cause a more egalitarian distribution of income and resources, a fairer society. And whether or not the society transitions to democracy or remains a dictatorship depends on the relative strength of the working and middle classes on the one hand in the landlords and capitalists on the other. Now, the strength of the classes can change. The relative strength of the classes can change. It's subject to changes in the political environment. And so the strengthening and size and density of the organization of the working or middle classes, the unions, the civil society organizations, 
the strengthening in the organization of those groups matters a great deal because it strengthens the cause of democratization. The weakening in size and power of the organization of the large landowners and capitalists, on the other hand, well, not, not on the other hand, but along with it also contributes to democracy. So democracy is understood as really the, the conflict between these two classes locked into this struggle with unequal power, although the power they have can change. Now, what's unsatisfying about this model? What's unsatisfying is that we assume that the lower and working classes act a certain way and that the upper classes act a certain way and that they take certain actions automatically. In this sense, it's rather deterministic, right? Shouldn't they be able to choose their preferences and choose their course of action? Well, sure, absolutely. But based on the experience in early modern England, this model would seem to make some sense, right? It seems to map to that example that I gave you. But there are other models. In the social forces tradition, although it is useful for comparing the interests in the capacities of the upper and lower classes, it's less useful in showing us the different choices that they could make at any given moment in time the different options that are available to them at any given moment in time. For example, look at these options, right? They have choices, presumably. We know that in early modern England, the new elites chose voice, but they could have also chose exit or loyalty. In the social forces tradition, the model basically assumes, basically assumes voice. It assumes that the two sides always act actively, use voice and pursue in every way a particular possible outcome that they already prefer. Now there's another model though that doesn't do that. This is an, the second perspective. This is an economic perspective that focuses again on the rich and the poor it makes the same assumptions about what the rich and the poor want. The rich want autocracy or dictatorship. The poor want democracy. The difference though, is that the two groups, the actors, they can choose what course of action they take. They may or they may not use voice. They may or they may not take certain courses of action in their relationship, their interaction with each other. So the rich, they might choose to repress and sustain an autocracy, or they might not, in which case they would allow a democracy. Any choice that they make has a cost. And so the rich are always making a choice or a decision about the relative cost and benefit of different alternatives. At the same time, the poor may revolt or mobilize, that is, or they may acquiesce. They can choose what to do. All the while, the level of inequality is going to affect the willingness of the rich to concede, and it might also affect the willingness of the poor to revolt. And so this model is different than the first model because it doesn't make the same assumptions about the course of action taken by the different actors it leaves that course of action open to choice, to freedom, if you will. Listen, everybody, we're not done with this. We'll continue on Friday where we pick it up again and do some exercises and simulations. Thank you very much for being here and listening to this lecture, mostly informational today, but I'll engage you more on Friday. I'll see you then.